If you don't know me or haven't gotten a chance to meet me, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the leaders here. Um, Pastor Ben is uh, traveling this past week. He's at, uh, speaking at a church in Alabama that's a strong supporter of New King. Um, New King wouldn't be possible without some really strong support by churches both here in Vermont as well as churches across the country. So in the meantime, you, you're stuck with me. And uh, I like to think that I'm the better looking Asian version of Ben, but that's actually probably not true. I am Asian, but that's, that's about it. Um, but I, you know, like, like many of you, I've been very encouraged by Ben's preaching over the past few weeks and especially the start of this series. We're in this series called The Last 48. It's about the last 40 hours of Jesus's life. And the book of John, we're in the book of John, and if you need a Bible, um, we're going to follow through the book of John. If you need a Bible, feel free to raise your hands. Phil has uh, some Bibles in the back. If you're new, we'd love to give you a Bible in your hand. Um, but we're in this series called The Last 48 Hours, where we're studying the life of Jesus in, in his last 48 hours, from the time of the Passover, his la the Last Supper, um, in John 13, all the way to the end of the book of John. And... Today's topic um, is a topic uh, that many of us maybe don't talk about much, and it's the topic of the Holy Spirit. And the person of the Holy Spirit is somebody we know is a part of the Trinity, we know is, um, you know, is somebody that's important in the Bible, um, but frankly, if we were honest, for most of us, uh, day to day, week to week, as we live our lives, the Holy Spirit's kind of a, an afterthought. Or some, somebody you don't even really think about much. And so today I hope that this message would be very encouraging to you as we talk about and look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. For many of us in this room, I would say for you know, most of us, we've probably experienced the loss of a loved one. And uh, even last fall, um, we at this church, we lost a loved one that many of you know, a girl named Becca, who um, was a UVM student here. I didn't get the chance to get to know Becca that well, but I know many of you did, and were really encouraged by her. And whenever you're experiencing loss, whether it's something you expect, like a terminally ill family member, or somebody that, something that's sudden, there's some things you hope for. You hope for the opportunity to speak to them again, right? You hope for something that would remind you on a daily or weekly or monthly basis of your relationship with them. You wish you could have something to hold on to that would make you feel the emotions or the uh, experiences that you had with that person. And often if you have a loved them, you're one you were really close with, you might visit places that you've been um, with them to, just so you can remember those times together. You might look at pictures in your, on your phone or that you've printed, um, just to remind yourself what they looked like. Um, if you're a family member, if it's a family member, you may go to a closet and smell some of their clothes still hanging there just to smell the scent of, of, of them, just so that you can have that familiarity with them. The closest person to me that's ever passed away so far in my life was my father-in-law. It was the man who raised my wife, Shannon. And uh, I remember getting to know him the first few years um, of, of us when we were dating and engaged. He was a rough guy, blue collar. He, drove, he was a long haul trucker. He uh, delivered wood. And um, it, it was a, Definitely a, a relationship from far because uh, we, we weren't living in Vermont at the time. Uh, I remember the day we heard that he got lung cancer and uh, he would only have about six months to live. And so we were living in Seattle at the time and we would fly from Seattle with our then uh, two-year-old son, Aiden, for Aiden to get to know him for the, for the last few months of his life. I remember being at his deathbed and reading the Psalms over him as he was passing away in the moment he finally breathed his last breath. And at, at that time, I didn't know him that well. I, 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 just, I just was newly married to Shannon. We had our first child. 
I didn't get to know him that deeply. But something inside me, as he was approaching the end of his life, said, I wish I had something that I could use to let my kids know the man that raised my wife. We all have that experience. We all, all can relate to that. When we, when we watch a movie and we see in a movie you, um, the people visiting the grave of a loved one and, and talking to the person that's passed away, we all can relate to that because we all wish we could experience that person another time at another moment. Well, that's the backdrop of the last 48 hours with Jesus. The disciples, imagine the disciples have spent three years with this amazing person, amazing man, the most amazing person you can think of. If you could think of the, the closest person you've ever lost, this is a hundred times over. You've spent three years with this amazing man who's literally transformed your world. He's taught you everything he knows about his father, God. He's taught you everything he knows about the Bible. He's taught you everything he knows about how to treat people. And he showed you. He showed you how to love people. He showed you how to look at people who were outcast by society. He showed you how to laugh and how to party. He changed water into wine just so the party could continue. Right? He healed people. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah, exactly. He healed people. He healed sick people. He healed lame people. And if you can imagine experiencing that for three years, these guys must have been torn to shreds inside as they knew that this would be the last time they would have a meal with their Savior. Imagine being one of those disciples. Most of the disciples, most scholars believed were teenagers. John being as young, the author John, who wrote the book of John, the time he met Jesus, most scholars believe he was probably 12 or 13 years old. Spent three years with him. So he was probably 16 or 17 at the Last Supper, sitting next to Jesus at the Last Supper. Right? Looking at this man who was in his 30s, looking at him as um, a father figure, as a teacher, and realizing, oh, Matt, wow, this man is going to go away. And so that's the backdrop that we enter into. It's a backdrop that, fortunately, John wrote, being the person that was literally sitting next to Jesus, he wrote by hand of, in detail for us and spent s about seven to eight chapters describing these, these last 48 hours. That's the backdrop we enter into. They, I could only imagine they wanted something to be different, right? They didn't want Jesus to go. They didn't want Jesus to go. And they were hoping for something or someone to hold on to so that they could continue those three years forever with him. We could all probably feel that way. Is if we were with Jesus for three years, we would have wanted that to go on forever. Forever. But Jesus obviously had a promise, a promise that he would go to the cross. And he was explaining that to them in the Last Supper. And today, we're going to learn about this person called the Helper that Jesus promised to send to the disciples. And this helper would be the best gift he could ever send to them. That the best gift somebody who was passing away, who was gonna go away, would ever be able to give to somebody. Today we're gonna look at who is the Holy Spirit? Who is this helper? Why did Jesus send this helper you know, the Holy, as the Holy Spirit? And what the Spirit was here to accomplish. We're going to look at that together. It's a lot to cover, so I hope that you have your ears attentive. And I really hope that you get to a, an opportunity, if you haven't, I hope you get an opportunity today to experience the Holy Spirit for yourself. That's really what I hope for. So let's pray as we go into this. God, thank you for this group of people. Thank you for bringing everyone that's here here. And today, Lord, uh, for those of you who know you, who have walked with you, who have submitted their lives to you, I pray that the Spirit would be very real to them today, that this helper that you promised to the disciples would be a real person to them, and that they would know that they could 
call on the Spirit for help in their time of need, and they know that their relationship with you um, is through this helper, the Spirit. And for those who don't know today um, you, Jesus, I pray they would come to know you today and that this message would really impact their lives. In your name we pray. Amen. So who, who is the Holy Spirit? We read in John 14 where Jesus first introduces us to this concept of the helper, and he talks to his disciples about this. John 14, 15. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and will be in you. Jesus says to the disciples right after the Last Supper that he's going to ask the Father to send another helper after he leaves, known as the Spirit of Truth. And that this Spirit would not be received by the world, but would dwell with the disciples, dwell with them, and dwell in them. Literally, this helper would come and live with them and live inside them. And this would be the person Jesus sends after he goes to the Father, after he goes to the cross, dies, is resurrected, and goes to the Father. So who is this Holy Spirit? Who is this helper? We're first introduced to the helper in Genesis 1, in the beginning of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. So in the very beginning, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the Spirit of God is God's own Spirit. He was there at creation, we, and he was there as a part of the creation story of creating everything with God. Okay, That's where we're first introduced to the Spirit in the Bible. We also learn that in history, before the time of Jesus, that the Spirit was given to specific, only specific men and women that God had called or had chosen to give the Holy Spirit to. In Exodus 31, the Lord said to Moses, See, I called uh, by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, the of the tribe of Judah, and then filled them with the Spirit of God, with the ability, intelligence, with knowledge, and all craftsmanship. Another example is in Numbers 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of Israel, elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them stand there, and I will come down and talk to them. And I will take some of the spirit that I've put in you, Moses, and I will put it in them, so that they share the burden of the people with you. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to them and took some of the spirit that was in Moses and put it into the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. So the Spirit was given by God to specific men and women in specific times and places in order to do specific things, like prophesy or rule over the people of Israel. Another example is in the book of Judges. In Judges, um, Judges were these pre-king rulers that the people of Israel cried out for to judge the people of Israel or to give them guidance. And um, in Judges, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged the people of Israel. Okay, so in, in history, before the time of Jesus, the spirit only came to specific men and women and they would rest upon these people, and it would allow God to use them to speak for him or to rule over the people of Israel or to do things on behalf of God. The Spirit was also a person that God could give and take away from people. In the time of Samuel, Samuel the prophet, when the king of Israel at the time was Saul, Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed David amongst his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, 
at the same time. So not only do we see the Spirit come to people for specific periods of time, we see God actually take the Spirit away from people. And in this context, Saul had been displeasing to God, and, no, and God no longer recognized him as the king of Israel. And so God came to Saul and took that Spirit away. So that's the way the Spirit interacted with people in the Bible before, before the time of Jesus. This spirit, the spirit was so important for people that it literally represented God's presence for people in the, in the Old Testament. We see this in the Psalms. In Psalm 51, this is one of David's Psalms. After he had greatly sinned, he had had an affair with this woman named Bathsheba. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and confronts him on behalf of God saying, you have had this affair. God sees that you have this affair, and you can't hide it from anybody. You can't hide it from God. This is what David says to God. Hide your face from my sins and block out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. So the spirit to people in the Bible before Jesus meant God's presence with them. It literally meant God's presence with them. That's how important the Spirit was. What's cool is the prophet Isaiah comes and he tells about a future when the Spirit would fill a person like no other person. Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he, his eyes see or decide disputes by what his eyes hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The prophet Isaiah was referring to Jesus. Jesus would come on the scene, and he would have the Spirit uniquely given to him. And we see Jesus literally given the Spirit at his baptism. His cousin John baptizes him, and the Spirit comes down upon him in Mark 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, and with you I am well pleased. So the spirit comes to Jesus and rests upon him. And when you read about the whole of Jesus's life, everything Jesus has done, does from that point on is empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's able to do everything he's able to do, heal people, teach with authority. He's able to do all those things because of the Holy Spirit. This is the first time we see in the Bible a person come empowered by the Spirit and live a perfect life by that Spirit. Jesus is the only person that accomplishes that. He comes and does that and shows as a model for the example what it's like to live by the Spirit. So that's kind of a little history of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Where, does, where, where is the Spirit introduced in the very beginning of the Bible? He's given to people, specific men and women, to do certain acts or deeds or to speak truths about God. And then he comes upon Jesus in the beginning of Jesus' ministry at Jesus' baptism. Why did Jesus send the Spirit? Why did Jesus send the Spirit? We read here again in John 14, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The first reason Jesus sends the Spirit was to be with the disciples, right? We talked about how he was going to go and the disciples were going to, the disciples were going to feel this pain of his loss. 
and they wanted a remembrance of him. And Jesus knew that they would be left alone, feeling like orphans, right? These guys were, most of these guys were teenagers. They'd spent three years of their lives with him. They had slept with him on the ground outside. They had ate with him, partied with him, laughed with him, cried with him. And now he was going to go away. And so Jesus brings the spirit to live with them and live in them. And he would be the perfect gift because the disciples could then carry on their relationship with Jesus through the spirit. The spirit literally represented Jesus's own spirit. It's as, it's as if Jesus said, you're going to have me and everything about me inside you, and I'm going to come and live inside you. And that's what Jesus gives them, this perfect gift of the Spirit. It's something that we, we wish we could have, right, from people who pass away, who go. We wish we could have their Spirit with us. And that's what we get to have with Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. He literally gives us his spirit to be with us and in us. It's a, it's a real relationship with Jesus. So real that the Bible talks about our ability to actually affect this spirit. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we can quench the spirit. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. We, can, we actually have the ability, as believers, to stop the Spirit. If we don't want Him to communicate with us, we can literally stop Him. We can quench Him. We can ignore Him, right? Ephesians 4 says we can even grieve the Spirit. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for redemption in the last day. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. So this is a real relationship. Jesus sends the Spirit to the disciples and to us in order to carry on a real relationship with Jesus. It's the reason why we can have a real relationship with Jesus. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. What's amazing about God is that before the time of Jesus, God was God, the Son of the Spirit. Right? God's Spirit, God's Word, the Son, Jesus, and the Father. All together as God, in perfect union with one another. Then the Word comes as Jesus in the flesh, as the perfect human, and lives a perfect life, empowered by the Spirit, goes to the cross, dies on the cross for our sins, is raised on the third day, defeats death, and goes up to heaven. And then he sends us his Spirit. What's amazing is now God has transformed Right? Because a human being is now a part of God, Jesus, the perfect human. A human being who lived the perfect life as God on, here on earth is now a part of the Godhead. And so we, through the Spirit, have this relationship with God in a perfect union. And the Spirit allows us to have that perfect union with Him. When we pray to God, Unlike the times before Jesus, when we pray now, we literally have a direct line to the Father through the Spirit. When we pray, we literally can speak directly to him. Before the time of Jesus, only these men and women who had the Spirit were given that ability. And then everybody else had to go through these prophets and priests in the temple. That's how they were able to speak to God. Today... With the Spirit, we're able to have this direct line of communication with Him. You can go to God directly and speak to Him. You don't have to have an advocate between you and God. Jesus already is that advocate. Through the Spirit, He's able to do that. That's amazing. That's amazing. The other reason why Jesus sends the Spirit 
is he sends the Spirit to remind the disciples of his teachings. Let's go back to John. John 14, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So Jesus not only sends the Spirit in order to have a continued relationship with him, but he sends the Spirit literally to help them remember the teachings he gave them for the past three years. Right Now, why is this important? Well, at the time of Jesus, the printing press hadn't been developed. right? And most of these disciples were illiterate men. Most of them didn't, didn't really even know how to read and write. So all, the only way they learned was for, through oral learning. They listened to his teachings. Well, if you ever try to remember three years' worth of teachings, I, I barely can remember last week's you know, teachings. For those of you students, the reason you take notes is so you can remember. Well, at this time, they had to remember three years' worth of teachings in order to pass it down to the people they would then teach. Jesus also knew that he had, was going to prepare these 12 guys to be the, the start of the church, to birth the church, right? And to be the ones to pass down his teachings. The best example, the most amazing example we have that this actually happened, that the Holy Spirit came and actually worked in these guys, is two of the Gospels. The Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew. Those were written by two disciples that were literally at the Last Supper, that were literally in the passage that we're reading. They heard these teachings firsthand. And so the Spirit comes and gives them remembrance so that they could remember the word for word, the teachings of Jesus. So that you and I, in the future, could rely on these words and, he, and read firsthand and be there in their experience. That's amazing, right? The Bible is in existence because the Spirit came down and fulfilled the promise that Jesus proclaimed. The book you're holding. The last reason that Jesus knew, the, you know, the last reason that Jesus sent the Spirit is that he knew that, the, uh, he knew that the disciples would be really afraid. And he was going to ask them to do something after he left that was going to be really hard. And that was to go and make other disciples. And that actually is, when we get to the end of the life of Jesus, that's the, the final teaching, the final command he gives them is, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching all have I commanded you, Right? So Jesus knew that they would need power in the Holy Spirit in order to do the work that he was asking them to do. So we've looked at who is the Holy Spirit. We looked at why did Jesus send him. And the last part we're going to look at is what will the Spirit accomplish? What will the Spirit accomplish when the Spirit comes? And uh, what will he accomplish both in the disciples as well as in us? We read in John 15 verse 26. John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. So Jesus tells us that the, one of the first things that G, the Spirit will accomplish when he comes is that he will bear witness about Jesus. He will bear witness about Jesus. That is the first and primary thing that, G, that the Spirit will do when the Spirit comes. What's amazing about the Bible is that we actually can literally read about the first time the Spirit then comes in the book of Acts. After Jesus is raised from the dead, he's resurrected from the dead, he spends 40 days with the disciples, 40 more days with the disciples. In those 40 days, the disciples have some more meals with him, and they also get some final teachings from him. And 
right before he goes up into heaven, Jesus says to the disciples to go to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And he says, wait in Jerusalem for the power promised by the Father and by me that will come to you. Wait in Jerusalem. So the disciples go to Jerusalem. They wait in this upper room and they pray and they pr they're praying together and the Holy Spirit comes. And this is a description of the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples for the first time in Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, the disciples, were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues and languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now in Jerusalem were dwelling Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this time, the sound, um, at the, and at this sound, the multitude came together, all the people came together, and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing these disciples speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each in his own language? Parthians and Medes and Alamites and Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So, What's happening? The disciples are there praying. The Holy Spirit comes, fills the room. And the first thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do is bear witness about God. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit wants to do. And not only that, the Holy Spirit wants to do it in as many languages as possible. This gives us insight into something that God really cares about, that the Spirit cares about, is the Spirit can't shut up about the gospel and the Spirit can't shut up about the gospel in as many languages as possible because God cares about everybody. God wants his gospel to be shared with as many people, as many tribes, as many languages, as many tongues, as many nations as possible. He wants it to be shared. God wants people to know that he's not owned by one group of people. He's not owned by the Jews. He's not owned by the evangelicals. He's not owned by the Catholics, right? He's not owned by white people. He's not owned by black people. He's not owned by Hispanics. He's for everybody. He cares about everybody. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit wants to do. It gives us insight into God's heart. He sends the Spirit in order to unite all people under Jesus. That's what Jesus means by bear witness. He's coming to do that, and that's his first and primary task. And when you read the rest of the book of Acts, it's one of my favorite books. I encourage you to read it. You will see the Holy Spirit empower normal human beings like you and me to go out and proclaim his gospel and do extraordinary things. That's what you see throughout the book of Acts. It's great. It's great. We get this firsthand account of the Holy Spirit doing these amazing works in the disciples and in ordinary people like you and me. The Bible also says a few other things about the Spirit. He says a few other things about the Spirit that the Spirit's going to accomplish. This, the Spirit is going to make you more like Jesus. The Spirit's going to make you Lord, more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, day by day, as you walk with him, is going to make you more like Jesus. That's a job of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was all, is also going to transform you. He's going to transform you inside and out. Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The Spirit's going to transform you. If you want more fruit in your life, more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, ask the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to transform you. He's in you already. That's His job. He's going to bring this out in you as you walk with Jesus. The Spirit also is going to help us in our weakness, in our times of need. Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever been in prayer or tried to start praying and you're like, I don't even know what to say, God. I don't know what I would say to you. For some of you, that stops you from praying because you're like, I, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin. What's amazing about the Spirit is when you're there before God in silence without any words to say, the Spirit is literally saying words for you on your behalf. He's groaning for you to God, interceding for you. He's speaking to the Father for you, saying, Hey, hey, Father, this is your son. This is your daughter. This is the person you saved. This is a person that you put with Jesus on the cross. This is a person that sins have been paid for in his cleanse. The Spirit is saying these words to your Father for you so that you don't have to have the perfect words. I know for some of you, praying is really challenging. You don't have to have the perfect words because the Spirit has those perfect words for you. You can just go to the Father and let the Spirit pray for you, speak for you. The Spirit also seals you in Jesus and is the guarantee of your salvation. The Spirit seals you in Jesus is in the guarantee of your salvation. Ephesians 1. In him, Jesus... Also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of the inheritance to the praise of his glory. The reason why we can be confident when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, that that is a perfected relationship and in God's eyes, that we're his sons and daughters, is because when that happens, the Spirit comes and he literally seals us as a down payment before God. It's like when you go buy a home, they're going to ask you for this down payment. Or when you go buy a car, they usually ask you for this down payment. And you give this down payment to say, I'm going to buy this home. The Holy Spirit comes and says, this is the son. This is your son. This is your daughter. It's God's ability to look at us as humanity and go, who has the spirit? Oh, that's my son. That's my daughter. That's my son. That's my daughter. We're, the spirit comes down in us and seals us for salvation. Lastly, the spirit gives each of us a spiritual gift to serve the church. One of the functions of the spirit is to actually give us a spiritual gift to serve the church. 1 Corinthians 12, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God, who empowers all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we see that the Spirit gives each of us a special particular gift in order to serve the church. The church being the body of Christ, right? So the gift might be speaking up here from up front, or the gift might be welcoming people in who are new. Your gift might be praying for people who are sick. Your gift might be helping lead music or worship. That's your gift. I haven't read it anywhere in here that the gift is just sitting down on Sunday mornings, right? And taking. That's not a spiritual gift. I know some of us feel like we're gifted in that, but it's not a spiritual gift. The gift that the Spirit's giving you is to serve one another. And so I tell people that if you're part of a church, your number one primary job is serving. That's your membership into the church. Your membership in the church is serving because 
when you submit your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and actually gives you a gift to use. And because we're God's chosen people, when you're given a gift, you don't want to waste that gift. You don't want to let that gift just go to waste and let it sit around. Spirit gives to each one of us. There's some final words Jesus says about the Spirit in John 16. John 16, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but I cannot bear them now. There's so much Jesus wants to say to his disciples about the Spirit, but he can't. He just can't, couldn't bear them because he knew he was going to go away. When the Spirit of truth comes, he would guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you all the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus sent his spirit to be the bearer of truth in our lives. As we walk with Jesus, the spirit will come and remind you about what's true and what's a lie in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus and you've repented of your sins, you've placed your life in Jesus' hands, the Spirit is already in you. The Spirit's already in you. And maybe this morning, your response to God is going to be, God, I never knew the Spirit was so impactful. I never knew the Spirit was uh, the reason why I could have this deep relationship with you. I never knew that I could call on the Spirit to advocate for me in times of need. I didn't know that the Spirit empowered me to serve you. So maybe your response this morning is repentance. Maybe your response this morning is to say to God, God, I've been walking with you, but I've known very little about the Spirit. I want to repent for that, and I want to start listening. I want to start depending on the Spirit to empower me in my walk with you. For those of you who aren't a follower of Jesus today, Jesus is extending you today an invitation to receive him. And by receiving him, you'll receive his spirit. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you, a real one. And the Holy Spirit allows him to do that. The only way to do that is if you come and submit yourself this morning to Jesus. If you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I accept that you came down to earth, lived the perfect life for us on my behalf, and that you came to the cross, died on the cross for my sins to reconcile me to your Father. That you, were res that you resurrected and you, you rose from the dead on the third day, and you defeated sin and death so that I could have a perfect relationship with you. If you come to Jesus and you believe that, you can have a spirit today, today. Let me pray. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you that you brought the spirit so that we could have an eternal, real relationship with you, just like you were still here, because you are. Amen.